WBAL-TV 11. This is breaking news. And what a day it's been here in Baltimore. Been keeping an eye on the key bridge throughout the day. The scene there hasn't changed much, but the de details have. Yeah, we do know that they are still searching for six people, six construction workers who fell into the water um, when that collapse happened at 1.30 this morning. Uh, Tommy Clark is live in Dundalk right now. And, and Tommy, we just got an update. Uh, what can you tell us? Well, you know, the AP is reporting six presumed dead, but we I just spoke with the Coast Guard. I've been calling them. They have a few different ports I can call and they are looking into it further for me. So I have not personally confirmed that, but that is the report from the AP. The last we heard is that this is still a search and rescue. Of course, this could be an update to this. You're watching this unfold live on air. Uh, so I'm texting and calling the Coast Guard, speaking with them about this. They're looking into it for me right now. Um, that is according to what the AP is saying. You know, we've been here all day, 15 hours since this incident happened. Happened. We've had multiple press conferences, hearing from everyone from the governor to President Biden in the White House. We've had a couple different press conferences with Governor Moore as well as one with the NTSP. That is who is leading this investigation while the Coast Guard is leading the search and rescue efforts. That's why when it comes to the fatalities, if there are any, as we were saying earlier, that would be with the Coast Guard that would be telling us this. When it comes to the last press conference we had, they were sharing with Pete Buttigieg about what comes next here when it comes to this bridge, this major port that impacts so much of our country, not just the Northeast Corridor, but our entire country and really internationally. You know, this boat, Dolly, it's from Singapore. So we're going to see folks from Singapore who own this ship coming here. We're expected to see them in the coming days. We also have several teams within the NTSB working on this investigation from every angle. You know, they were explaining it earlier, saying they have someone here, an individual who is solely focused on human error. So they're seeing if there was human error in this. Um, the latest update that we got had to do with the construction workers. We have not heard if there were anyone driving on that bridge. That has been the question that's been remaining all day and something that officials have not been able to answer. Right behind me here, they've been bringing in several trailers. This is likely to help with a command post, not only for the investigation, but once they start rebuilding this. So I don't know if you can see behind me, we have a semi truck going by with another trailer setting up here. Um, so let's take a listen. When it comes to these press conferences, you know, Governor Moore speaking, the mayor, um, even like I said, the president. Let's take a listen first to what the governor was saying, um, you know, speaking with the first responders. Take a listen. Everybody has stepped up. Everybody has raised their hands to serve. And I can tell you, it is so deeply appreciated. It's so deeply felt. And for everyone who is offering prayers and supports, I can tell you those prayers are working. The NTSB then telling us about, you know, this focus is on the search and rescue. Throughout, we've had several press conferences here in Dundalk at the staging area. And each press conference we've had, we've asked about what comes next. And they've said, you know, our focus is on the search and rescue. Take a listen to what NTSB, the leaders in this investigation, what they're telling us today. What's the priority beyond the search and rescue? Uh, we don't, you know, certainly investigations are a priority. Certainly environmental uh, considerations are a priority. And uh, so is uh, traffic and getting, you know, cargo uh, vessels in and out of the port of Baltimore. It's not the NTSB's priority. We have a number of uh, organizations, including the Department of Transportation, Maryland Department of Transportation, the governor that's doing a lot of work on that. But this is it right now. It's about people. It's about uh, families uh, and uh, addressing the needs of those that were impacted. That's the focus. I don't think anybody in that room right now at, a, at the command post is thinking about what are the next steps to get things cleaned up. They're fi they're working to figure out. Uh, who was impacted, if anyone was impacted, and how do we address that? Because that is and should be the priority always. 
Governor Moore says that he's been speaking with those families of those involved. Again, the number we've been hearing all day, NTSB is not confirming, but local officials have confirmed eight individuals involved here. Two rescued, one did not want to get medical attention. The other individual was taken to shock trauma and we've heard has since been released. That means that they're looking confirmed for six people in this incident at least. Again, waiting to hear about anyone driving on that bridge at the time. The governor says that authorities were able to stop some drivers who were about to go on the bridge. But other than that, we haven't been told if anyone was in fact driving, if any cars went into the water. And that is why there are still helicopters overhead, divers in the water working on this investigation. This is going yeah, to be a long process, that. guys. We're so we've been hearing from all these different officials as they work together to get out the pertinent information here especially the search and rescue. That is the big point right now, um, but I'm sure, you know, in the coming hours even, that is going to change. So I'm going to keep speaking with the Coast Guard. I have had a couple phone call conversations with them, and I'll keep you guys updated. But for now, back to you. All right, Tommy, thank you. The video still gets me is when you see the ship and lights go off, lights come back on, the black smoke. I mean, you, it's just odd to watch all this sort of play out right in front of you. And it's so fast, too, yeah. from, from one second. You see the ship, like like uh, Tolly was showing us through that video. Right, the smoke yeah. is there, and then it literally falls within seconds. Yeah. So it's, it's just incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, uh, we mentioned here a little bit about divers yeah. uh, with Tommy, and that's a big part of all huge, of this. Huge, huge. Yeah, the search and rescue teams, they've been going through the water to try and find the missing crew members. Andre Hepkins joining us now from the 11th. News Live Desk with those efforts ongoing right now. Andre. And Jason and Ashley, our own Brianna Ross is actually volunteering with her church to help feed those first responders and divers. Take a look at this video that she shot from the scene. According to Baltimore City Fire Spokesperson Kevin Cartwright, at least 50 divers are on the scene. They are from the Anne Arundel County Fire Department, the Prince George's County Fire Department, as well as other local volunteer companies. State Police Trooper dive teams are also on the scene, and we're looking at this video right now. According to Kevin Cartwright, the teams are using side scan sonar and infrared technology to locate and identify the vehicles that fell when the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed into the Patapsco River. And if these dive teams find anyone inside these vehicles, they will secure the cars with a buoy. Already we're told they've identified a truck that's in two parts and they believe there are others. Ashley. Yeah, that's still, sorry, Dre, that's still a big question you're hearing, you know, the conflicting information, at least yeah. from Tommy earlier. Mm -hmm. How many are they looking for and how many will end up being in the water there just beneath the bridge? Yeah, and hopefully, um, I know the NTSB is meeting at 5 o'clock tonight. Maybe they'll get some more information. Yeah. They haven't told us when the next press conference will be, but we're hoping soon to try to, try to parse all that out. Sure. Also yeah. getting some updates now from Shock Trauma about a patient that they had treated there. and We were learning just a little bit uh, as it's been coming out, that patient released. Yeah, thankfully. And let's go back to 11 News anchor, Deborah Wiener. Deb, what do we know right now? Boy, doesn't that speak to the miracle of what they do at Shock Trauma, that they received a critically injured patient who is now home. It's really extraordinary. So here's what we know. As we know, Shock Trauma sees six to 7,000 people coming in uh, every year. If they can handle anything, we know they can. So they received word at 2 a.m. that there was a mass casualty event. They then notified authorities they could handle 10 critically injured individuals. At 2.30 in the morning, they received one of those critically injured individuals who was in fact on that bridge. Take a listen to what they had to say what happened next. Shortly after that, we started getting uh, telephone calls from faculty and staff who were aware that the incident had occurred, who were not on call, uh, but were calling to see if they could be useful to come in and volunteer. This is something that happens quite regularly. Around 2.30 a.m., uh, the patient arrived and we began taking care of him at that point. Um, we also have been, had been and continued to be in communication with the first responders in the field to get some idea of what was going on on the scene. We also were monitoring uh, the Maryland State Police Aviation Command's helicopters and looking at flight patterns to see and uh, to be notified if any of them were bringing patients to us at that point. We prepare for this. Unfortunately, these disasters um, uh, occur and we train and prepare and drill for this exercise, not just managing the care, the uh, acute clinical care, but mobilizing the different resources, so many moving pieces. 
as Dr. Kundi and Efron mentioned, to accommodate as many possible patients effectively and efficiently as possible. I'll tell you, when you hear them discussing how they prepare for this, how they drill for this, you certainly appreciate that. But how can one prepare and drill for the image that we have all seen play over and over and over again since early this morning? It's really extraordinary. I know we've been discussing this all day that no matter how many times you see it, is, it is, we're still incredulous that this iconic bridge named after Francis Scott Key, that this iconic bridge would topple in seconds before our very eyes. So many questions still to be asked, to be answered, and certainly that individual who was sent to shock trauma in the wee hours of the morning and who is now home has an extraordinary story to tell of survival and of trauma, and we certainly wish them well in their continuing their recovery. I just cannot imagine the story that individual has to tell. Guys. I mean, it's just like the story of the neighbor that you had earlier. You know, you, it's, you, know, you don't think yeah. about it, but you're saying, listen, the life of Baltimore runs through Dundalk. And you don't think about it right. until this, and you understand everything. What did Kate say? Everything from toilet paper to cars comes yeah, through that terminal? Yeah, it, it is. Uh. And not only for us, but really for the entire country. Yeah. I mean, it is a um, yeah. one of the biggest ports. So big impacts all over the place. Deb, thank you. Um, 11 News reporter Kate Amara joins us live now as well. And, and Kate, there's a mass tonight for the people involved in the collapse. What can you tell us about that? That's exactly right. It's at 530. It's at the Cathedral of Mary, our queen. Uh, it's praying for all those who've been impacted by this accident. And I'll tell you somebody who is probably thrilled to hear that that one of the two people rescued has been released from shock trauma is Jesus Campos. And that explains why we haven't seen him around here. He kind of disappeared about an hour ago. I, I went to look for him uh, to ask him some follow up questions. He um, is the man that we've been speaking to today who uh, works for Brawner Builders, uh, who, the company that was contract contracted to have the work crew on the bridge today. He has been distraught. He said that is uh, it was a seven member crew. The one member that was rescued, he said, was in critical condition at the hospital. The last he knew uh, and he said the families of the other six of his friends, co-workers, and he called them family members at this point, um, their families were just sitting at home, he said, waiting for the call. Uh, he So he is the one who gave us a lot of the details about this crew uh, that was doing uh, road work, uh, pothole work, according to state officials. Um, he said it's a job he's done before for the company. Uh, he believes their shift was 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., that they shut down parts of, of of the roadway across the key bridge at nine last night so that this work could take place and that this crew of seven was supposed to be sorry that's windy back here was supposed to be on until five o'clock in the morning he told us at the time of the collapse they were on a 30 minute break which is standard it's how they operate and that what they do on a break is they take their breaks in their cars uh, pickup trucks actually he said there were would have been four of them and that his friends and co-workers would have been in their cars, some eat something, drink a little bit of water or something, uh, some close their eyes. He said it's very hard, strenuous work. Um, and he said him, uh, Jesus, and his other colleagues who were not working on this shift are just beside themselves. They know how dangerous and precarious it can feel to be that high up on that bridge that he said feels like it's moving up and down all the time. But then he said they just can't imagine what it was like to be on that bridge. Um, so we did speak to him and through an interpreter. He was very gracious. He was very emotional as well. But we want to um, share a little bit with you of what Jesus Campos told us today. I am so, so bad. I feel so bad right now that this has happened. Mr. Campos told us three of the men were from Mexico and were related to each other. He said two were from Guatemala, the rest from Honduras and El Salvador. We asked him, what do you want people to know about your friends and about what happened? No, pues, somos... They were good people. They were good workers, he said. They were working so that they could send money home to their countries. 
Tenemos, <coughs> tenemos familias que los esperan en casa. It's too much to bear right now because all the families are waiting at home for the phone calls. And you can't help, or I, I couldn't help but make the connection between the crew members on this road crew who were working on the bridge and, according to the um, Apostleship of the Seas director, the 22 seafarers who were on board the container ship, all of them, according to the people who knew them and talked to them, were doing it for their families so that they could uh, send money back home to have a better life. And um, uh, Director Middleton of the Apostleship of the Sea said for the folks on the container ship, for those seamen, uh, oftentimes that's the only way uh, they sign up for eight, nine month stints away from their families. That's the contract and they do it because that's the way that they earn money for their families so their families can have a better life. It's just very interesting that um, especially this bridge that's uh, and this place that's about the port and working people uh, is also the people that were involved, directly involved and impacted by this are people who are just working. They're just working their jobs. Um, so Mr. Campo said he's hoping and praying for the families and for his friends who remain unaccounted for. I will say, um, we have noticed a lot of equipment coming in and out. It could be a shift change, which happens. Um, it's five after five o'clock, but we have seen a couple of uh, ambulances go in down to Hawkins Point in the last hour. Um, who knows if they just needed some people on standby, um, but that is something that we have seen. Uh, we've seen some people come out, some people go in, and that's one of the um, kinds of vehicles that we saw go in there tonight. So that's what's happening here right now at Hawkins Point as far as the public is being allowed to go and we'll send it back to you. All right, then a motion from Mr. Campos. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kate. We appreciate it. Uh, and you've been looking a bit, actually, at New York Times and a little bit of a, some flavor that goes along with the search. Yeah, kind of giving us a little bit more information about what's happening tonight and into tomorrow morning. But this was coming out a few minutes ago from the New York Times. They spoke with the Baltimore City Fire Department and uh, Kevin Cartwright, the, the spokesperson for the department, said that the divers will work until dark tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll stop and then resume again tomorrow when it's dawn. But he's saying that it's, it's, it's very difficult out there because of all of the steel that is in the water. It's yeah. making the, the diving efforts very difficult. I mean, we were talking, you imagine getting through all of all of the steel, the layers, bridge, yeah. the layers and layers and the concrete and those trucks if they were out there, but um, not an easy effort, but it looks like they will uh, continue that effort uh, until, like I said, dark and then stop and resume tomorrow at dawn. Sure, and keeping with the ship for a bit, 11 News Investigates has obtained some uh, inspection uh, details of this ship that caused the bridge's collapse and shows that authorities in June, they actually found two deficiencies with the ship. Yeah, investigative reporter Tolly Taylor joining us now live in Tolly earlier. You you brought us the most recent inspection of the bridge. Now you have some new information about the ship. Yeah, the US Department of Transportation has a national bridge inventory and it shows the key bridge was last inspected in May 2021. At that time, inspectors rated it in fair condition overall. Now DOT rated the deck portion of the bridge, the top portion, the superstructure underneath that and the substructure that holds it all up, giving all three a six on a scale of zero to nine with nine being excellent. So according to the rating categories, that means it was in satisfactory condition with quote, some minor problems. Now, a question we're still trying to answer right now, these inspections are supposed to happen every 24 months. And so uh, that would mean another inspection was supposed to happen in May, 2023, just before I came on air, the press assistant for the U.S. Transportation Secretary, Pete Buttigieg, let me know that there was a May 2023 inspection. She reports that that inspection found that the key bridge was in satisfactory condition again, with an overall rating of fair again. So we'll update you as soon as we have more information. We're going to try to get our hands on that. Yeah, and Tali also found the inspection reports. Uh, you've been through all the paperwork, inspection report for the ship as well. Yeah, we found that uh, there have been 27 inspections since the Dolly came into service back in 2016. And there were no problems according to the inspections until this past June. Records show the ship was inspected when it was docked in San Antonio, Chile on June 27th. Now, the Chilean authorities found that the ship had two deficiencies, one for propulsion and one for auxiliary machinery. The description for the deficiencies says gauges, thermometers, etc. So, how could that be connected to what's happening this morning, uh, to what happened this morning? Well, 
The U.S. Department of Homeland Security said this afternoon that the Dolly, quote, lost propulsion as it was leaving Baltimore Harbor. So that makes this inspection from June especially interesting. Propulsion was the issue back in June, and today we have Homeland Security saying propulsion played an issue as the Dolly crashed into the Key Bridge, causing its collapse. Back to you guys. All right. Tali, um, inf information very interesting for sure. Um, Want to go back out to Kim Dacey. She's live. She was at Stony Beach. I know she had moved to Rivera Beach. Kim, are you still at Rivera Beach or are you, have you moved again? No, we're at Rivera Beach still here to give you kind of a better perspective on uh, the crash site and what it looks like. We're got a, we've got a higher vantage point here. And if you see behind me, you can see out there where the two um, side parts of the bridge are still intact. Those are the concrete parts, but the entire middle is just gone. And you can see in the water there where the bridge is sticking up and even laying on top of that cargo ship that hit the, sh the uh, bridge around 1.30 this morning. Uh, so you can see that that, you know, basically the bridge is gone. There are two ramps up to nothing now. Uh, that steel is sticking out of the water and they're keeping boats back a certain distance away from the crash site as those search teams and, and dive teams go down uh, to try to try to get these folks out of the wreckage down there. Uh, but folks who lived in the area, we've been talking to them basically all day. A lot of them heard a loud bang around 1.30. Some of them didn't hear anything at all and didn't hear about it until people started calling and emailing them and uh, texting them early this morning saying, hey, did you see what happened to the bridge? The the key bridge is no more. It's gone. And a lot of them didn't even believe it. Um, they were just such in shock. And so they came out to where we were a little earlier uh, this morning to look at the bridge or what is left of the bridge uh, to see for themselves because they just can't believe that this happened. I think there's just a feeling of, of shock and awe as, as people hear about it and see it and just can't believe that this happened. Uh, but we did speak to a couple of residents who were nearby and here's what they had to say. My fiance woke up about that 1.30-ish time frame. He said he heard a loud bang, didn't think much of it, went back to bed. Uh, woke up a couple hours later, I imagine, to the noise of all the helicopters and just the noises that were going around outside. Um, picked up his phone to kind of see what was going on, saw what happened, woke me up. Of course, we ran out here, took a quick look, and have been following it ever since. We got up, came here. I guess a lot of neighbors heard... Um you know what sounded like an explosion um, but obviously it wasn't so uh, yeah we came here and there was a couple people checking everything out so we're hoping everyone's okay now we also had the opportunity to speak to a couple of port workers who came out to look at the wreckage one of them said her husband was at the port today and she said it's as quiet as it's ever been there of course with ships not being able to get in or out she also said uh, you know there's just another way that this is going to affect everyone in this area that her whole family works at the port so they don't get paid if the ships don't come in so if there are ships that aren't able to get in and out for days, weeks, months, um, that's really going to affect them and affect their, their lifeline and their livelihood. Um, a lot of households around here are dependent uh, on the ports to make their living. And again, you know, if those ships can't get in, they can't get paid. So that's just one other effect of this. In addition to the transportation, of course, um, you know, folks are going to have to find another way to get around. Um, they can't use that bridge anymore. So 95, 895, even the west side of the Beltway are probably going to be a lot more crowded from now on uh, until until this bridge is eventually fixed as folks try to find those alternate routes to get around. So, um, you know, the main concern, of course, of people is those folks who are still unaccounted for in the water that those divers are searching for. Uh, but once the search and rescue effort is over, there is a number of issues down the road um, that everyone in this area is going to face. Um, so that's the very latest here in Riviera Beach. I'm Kim Dacey, WBAL TV 11 News. Right, and as we know from the morning show, when we work together. You yeah. spent some time doing some traffic. So, you know, Baltimore Beltway in the morning doesn't matter or wet side or that top side, it's a mess. And I'm guessing added volume and then you have that construction up there by Pikesville. I mean, yeah. this is going to be felt around the loop. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Beltway is always a mess. I presume it's going to be more so. It might be mitigated a little bit this week, maybe next week because schools are on spring break. But once schools go back in session, I think everyone's going to feel it big time.
Betsy, thank you. We appreciate your time. Tommy Clark also has been hanging out and waiting for us as well. She was there for that NTSB uh, uh, news conference. She's not quite ready for us just yet. She has Tom Costello with her from NBC's. She is ready now. Tommy Clark, I uh, want to check in with you. You're getting a bit of a, I guess, a national perspective. Yeah, now. yeah. What, what can you tell us? You know, we have senior correspondent for NBC News, Tom Costello here. Tom, you were telling me how you've covered investigations with the NTSB for years. Yeah. How does it compare to what we're seeing here today? Well, this is clearly going to be one of the biggest investigations the NTSB has handled in years. Now, a lot of people think of the NTSB as, of course, being the primary body for aviation accidents, but they do more than that. They do, of course, maritime accidents. This will be one of their biggest ever. They've got 24 investigators on the scene. The first thing they do is make it very clear, don't expect them to draw any conclusions anytime soon. They will not do that. They will not in any way guess. They're going to lay out the facts, and they're very good about, trans about uh, providing the facts to us, the public, as they go Great, along. You. Not drawing conclusions, but here are the facts that we've established. But the formal investigation, all the way through the board meeting, which will clearly probably end in a board Senator meeting Carden. in Washington, D.C., that probably nice won't happen for a year, 18 months before they come up with a final determination of the cause. The cause may seem obvious right now. The question is why, not just what, but why. And when it comes to this ship, you've been doing some legwork looking into the history yeah. of this ship out of Singapore. What have you learned? Well, it has been inspected 27 times since 2015. We've confirmed that. Uh, in addition, last year it had a propulsion issue. It was cited for deficiency with propulsion. Also, back in 2016, it hit the port in Antwerp, uh, and it caused hull damage to this ship. As you know, these are global hey, ships. Aaron. They literally are going all over the sorry. world. So, sorry. so Meg? you know, they may have an incident in one country and another country and another, and another country, but trying to hey, gather Meg? all of that data together so that you get a good feeling for the history of the ship is can be the challenge right, so here. We are going I to find it very interesting, and it speaks to uh, the cooperation and the reputation of the NTSB that Singapore is seen to their own investigators here. Block. This is a Singapore-flagged vessel, so they are a party to the investigation under right international law, and they're sending right their right own right. investigators <laughs> to work with the NTSB. How does this compare to what you've seen before? We were saying off-camera before how this is so unbelievable. So if you get we a have super this just behind uh, us here. Ben How does this compare please. to what you've seen in, in your years of coverage? Well, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, this is truly <laughs> unbelievable and staggering. And I think what many people are asking is how is it possible, number one, that the support structures for the bridge weren't better protected to be able to withstand this kind of an impact? But I talked to a civil engineering professor at Johns Hopkins who said, what the law of physics suggests that when you're traveling with that much momentum, that much weight at about nine miles per hour, uh, it takes so long to stop that it was going to cause significant, if not permanent and irreparable damage to that support structure. That, that's just something it would have happened at any bridge in the country, he said. Nonetheless, as they work to rebuild that bridge, and by the way, he is suggesting this is going to take five to ten years. It is a massive, massive Sorry undertaking. Sorry if I'm messing with your half uh, But your when half they rebuild it and using bank. 21st century technology, they're going to have to ask the question, how do we better protect these bridges? Yeah. And I know your coverage, when will you be on? When can we okay. tell Thank folks you. about this, what you've been looking into? NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Uh, and then we'll also be reporting live for the Today Show. And we are up live constantly on NBC News Now streaming. So it's been an all-day all day effort along with you guys. Yeah, boots on the ground, good job. All right, so of course, this is going to be a long road ahead. We're going to continue to be here and look into this, but of course, for now, back to you guys. Tommy right. and Tom, thank yeah. you. Appreciate it. Okay, so Sky Team 11 and Captain Roy Taylor uh, live over the Collapse Key Bridge. He's been there for pretty much all day today. Yeah, and that scene really hasn't changed from your vantage point, I'm guessing, Roy, at this point. So there's still a lot of park going on, though, from what we can see as far as divers in the water in the area that they were concerned about were those vehicles that were on uh, the key bridge ended up going into the water. Uh, right now you're looking live at the uh, bow of that container ship. And I mean, you can see the roadway is literally sitting on top of the bow of that container ship. We can also tell you that it looks like uh, there's a small barge that's working its way in towards the scene here. Not quite sure how it's going to be involved with the uh, rescue or investigation of this incident that we have here. But I can pretty much guarantee you they'll probably end up getting commercial divers.
commercial salvage divers to come in here and do the work as far as removing the steel girders that are over the uh, trusses from the uh, key bridge, removing it from the uh, the cargo ship. Uh, so, I mean, it's going to be a very intense operation here. They're going to be bringing in huge barges that have cranes on them to help lift the uh, steel that's underwater and lift the roadway here. Now, the original bridge that was here that actually fell down them when they were building it, uh, pieces and portions of that still remain. Actually, I know on the uh, northwest side of the location here, in the water, under, under the water. So I don't know what their plans are as far as removing the steel girders that are here at the location. But like I said, it'll be some extremely heavy equipment, some very large cranes uh, that is going to be utilized just to take and start the removal of the equipment. And I guarantee you, when it gets to that type of operation, they're going to have uh, commercial divers actually work in this detail as opposed to fire department and or law enforcement. So we're still monitoring it. If you have any questions, go ahead and shoot them out to us. But reporting in Sky Team 11, I'm Captain Roy Taylor. Still, it still amazes me, Roy, just the weight that this uh, ship is able to hold. You know, it's got all the cargo uh, containers with it, but also the weight of that uh, bridge still on the front of there. It's just, I mean, it's a feat of engineering, I suppose, but it's still awe-inspiring when you, when you look out at it. Um, from the sounds that we may have lost, Roy, so we'll, we'll keep on moving. <laughs> all right, want to take a look at some of, of uh, oh, Roy, you are still there? We're still here if you want. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, no, I was just, just, we were marveling at the engineering of this, of this ship being able to hold on to so much all at once. I mean, it's... It's incredible, really. That's plausible, but I don't know if the bow of the vessel is actually now run aground, so to speak. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, I mean, you can see uh, there are two concrete bunkers that are down there, one in the lower left corner yeah. and one in the top right. And those bunkers are actually the markings of the channel. They're designed there to help protect the bridge for when they have vessels that are going through. But I mean, it's plausible that the vessel is actually run aground from hitting, you know, the uh, prison Buxman here and having the bridge collapse on top of it. I mean, the stern is sitting up a little bit higher, the bow is a little bit lower, but I mean, as, as you were saying, you know, a lot of weight, but that's also a lot of area. Yeah. And it's, you know, that, that they're dealing with as far as the uh, steel that's on the uh, cargo ship. Remarkable. All right, Roy, thank you, as always. You're welcome. Appreciate it. All right, uh, take a look at this. This is uh, what it looked like when firefighters arrived on the scene. The Baltimore City Fire Department Rescue uh, One shared these photos. This is basically showing the conditions of the bridge. Kind of an up-close look there. Uh, you can see the bridge just totally mangled, and it's kind of leaning over the cargo ship, the dolly. And it also really provides some perspective of how the bridge actually hit the ship when that collision happened. Uh, this morning's collapse, it's now raising a lot of questions, um, but especially how structurally sound was the key bridge before the collision? The NTSB said that is yeah. something they're looking into. Yeah, David Collins as well. He's been following this angle throughout the day. He joins us live again in the newsroom. What'd you find, Dave? Well, the last federal, the last federal inspection of the bridge in May of 2023 indicated it was in satisfactory condition. And the governor late this afternoon said it was up to code. And we talked with a number of experts who questioned why the bridge's piers were so close to the shipping channel. And they wonder why they didn't have bumpers or fenders that could have buffeted the impact. However, listening to the NTSB today explain the tonnage involved, it doesn't sound like anything would have stopped this one. Even bridge experts who saw the collision video say it was a surreal sight, something that is made of steel and concrete to seemingly so easily collapse and so fast. But the way that it collapsed, um, and I think that was surprising to, to some people in particular because one of the piers was hit, um, but all three of the spans collapsed. The key bridge was a steel truss arch structure with four lanes of highway. It took five years to build. It opened in 1977. Experts question in high sight the location of the bridge piers. Why will the a bridge pier be that close to, uh, you know, where the ships are navigating out of the port? The 47-year-old bridge was not built with redundancy. So if one support pier goes down, so do the rest. 
Several experts we talked with say pier bumpers, or what some call fenders, may have helped to buffer the impact. I think they would have been effective in this. At least they would have reduced the impact or at least prevented the ship from impacting directly those, you know, impacting the piers directly. Because, I mean, the way it went, I mean, it was just almost, you know, effortlessly it seemed. I mean, the the, the vessel hit the the pier, and it just went. I mean, there was no hesitation. The U.S. Department of Transportation last inspected the bridge in May of 2023. They declared it in fair condition. Governor Wes Moore echoed that assessment. In fact, the bridge was actually fully up to code. The key bridge was considered vital to commerce and commuters. That bridge uh, serves an important purpose, not only as a daily um, uh, commuter bridge, but also as the um, the, the the way that trucks carrying hazardous materials can cross the Patapsco River. One expert says one lesson learned when the bridge is rebuilt, keep the piers uh, farther apart. Reporting live from the newsroom, David Collins, WBAL TV 11 News.